I can see you now. How are you doing, Yaron? I'm good. I, 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 you were told not to let me get away with anything, so I expect no less of you. <laughs> and I expect that of you. Uh, so I, I watched you uh, do a, uh, another just conversation about the same subject uh, with our uh, mutual friend Gene Epstein uh, at, the, uh, at the Soho Forum uh, in New York. Uh, and, you know, I, I found it interesting enough that, you know, that I wanted to invite you on to, uh, to talk about it today. I think maybe in that conversation, there was more time spent um, on the semantic issue right, about how to define some of the terms yep. uh, that, that, I, that I would like, because I think there is something to be said about that, but I think there's also a way that that could be kind of bracketed and we could talk about, okay, um, like, here's one way of using the term, here's another way of using the term, that's great. Now, what's actually true about selfishness, neither of these senses, I'm hoping we can get into that. Uh, so, uh, but first, uh, do you want to uh, say who you are just for a minute? Sure. My name is Jaron Brook. Uh, I uh, used to be the CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. I am now the chairman of the board. I also host uh, the Jaron Brook Show on uh, on uh, YouTube and, and a podcast. So uh, uh, I I don't know that any of your viewers will will like anything I say, <laughs> but if you do, come over there and and uh, and uh, subscribe. Uh, I cover a lot of different topics uh, from the perspective of objectivism, which is Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's philosophy. And let me just say, you'll have to invite me back sometime to debate that video we just saw. Which oh, I no, I, I would love that. Right? Worse than <laughs> abhorrent, right? Uh, dishonest, <laughs> dishonest to the core. So I would yeah. love to, I would love to debate well, well, every, well, I, every I, aspect of it. <laughs> I certainly, uh, I certainly don't think so. Right. I think I, I know you don't. <laughs> I know, that's uh, right. Everything you said <laughs> there, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, Absolutely, there is an invitation to uh, to come back in the future uh, to get into anything that's covered in the video that uh, that that we don't talk about today. Uh, maybe if David Griscom would like to talk to you about that, I certainly would. Right. So regardless of whether he does or not, you certainly have that invitation. But the reason okay. that I want, I, as I want you know, to... I, I debate a socialist often, and and uh, and I think it's a it's an important debate to have. Uh, you, you guys have a, a large audience of young people, and. Uh, and and I think I think exposing them to the real differences in ideas rather than Glenn Beck, who I think is yeah, you know, not a great defender of individualism or, or freedom for that matter, or capitalism. Uh, I, I think this debate is more interesting. Yeah, look, I mean, I think Beck is worth arguing with because lots oh, yeah. of people, lots of people are listening to what he's saying, uh, right. and I'm, I'm sure you think uh, that socialists are worth arguing with uh, for similar reasons, uh, if nothing else. Yep. Uh, but the uh, the reason uh, that that I wanted to to introduce this this topic by talking about that is because that sets up how I would certainly see this issue about selfishness and self assertion and, and individual greatness. Right. That uh, that it's not these it's not that uh, pursuit of individual excellence uh, is a bad thing. Uh, but uh, but I do think that there's a real difference about whether all of morality is about pursuit of individual excellence uh, and, and, whether, and whether Rand's view about this is right. Uh, but I, I don't want to anticipate too much of what you're going to say. So, uh, so why don't we just take the next few minutes, like part of the value of, of what I'm trying to add here with this show is that I don't just, I don't just want to talk to people I agree with, sure. right? I, I also want to talk to people who I vehemently disagree with, right? I think, I think you just said everything uh, David Griscom said was abhorrent, right? So, yeah. uh, so, let's, so, so let's do that, right? So why don't, why don't you just take a few minutes to lay out Rand's view about selfishness and, and why you think that's right and how you think that's different from how people like me might be getting this wrong. Sure, and I don't know what you're getting sure, about self-interest or selfishness. Uh, let's let's just say so let, I'll, might be getting I'll, I'll present my view and then you sure. can... Sure. You can you can uh, present yours, and then we'll we'll have a discussion about it. Look, I I think that um, human beings, and I'm going to go pretty basic, and then and then expand. I'm going to go to the foundation of morality. I think, which is fundamentally a choice that every individual faces about whether he wants to live or not to live. And and this goes to the very nature of 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 being human. We don't we're not born with the knowledge of how to live, how to live well, how to survive even. We, we don't know how to hunt. We don't know how to do agriculture. I mean, agriculture is a massive achievement that took 90,000 years of human beings being alive before they figured it out. Hunting is a massive achievement that took 
to figuring out tools and weapons in order to figure out and only then could human beings success. So human survival is an achievement. And every one of us has to, in a sense, achieve that in our own lives. And to do that, we need to discover the knowledge necessary in order to survive, to thrive, to achieve, to be somebody, to live with a capital L, to be successful uh, at living. And that, I think, is what morality should teach us. So in my view is morality should be about, and this is kind of goes back to Aristotle, Aristotle's view of morality. Morality should be about the values and virtues that we all should adapt, the universal values and virtues that apply to every human being, that are necessary in order for human beings, A, to survive, and B, to thrive, to just be successful at living as a human being. And it's important here to recognize what does it mean as a human being? What makes human beings unique? What makes human beings different than other animals? Well, one is we have, we have the capacity to choose. We have free will, which other animals don't. They're automatized. They, they are born with the knowledge of how to live. It's all automatic. They don't get to choose. But what to choose, how to choose, um, that, is, that is the key. And what makes us human is the fact that we have this capacity, a reason, our ability to think rationally, to make choices. So if I am pursuing my life, if I want to live the best life that I can live, if I want to live a great life, if I want to live the, the best life available to me, then I need to live based on my own nature. And my own nature is, as Aristotle again put it, as a rational being, as a thinking being, as a reasoning being. Therefore, for egoist, for somebody interested in their own life, making the most of it, the most important thing to do is be rational, use reason, think, um, and, and choose, use reason to choose the values that are necessary to live a good life. And, and while there are certain universal values that I think apply to all of us, the specific values are going to defer. We're going to have different approaches to what to do in life in order to achieve our personal greatness or, or to live that full, complete, whole life that is possible to us. Um, you know, other, other things that, that, that I think are necessary, and this, this goes to some of the political issues that evolve over on socialism. One of the necessary things for human beings to, to I think, be successful in life is to be productive. It's to produce something. It's, it, whether it's art or whether it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a product or whether it's anything, you have to be able to take care of your material well-being yourself. You have to be able to, today in a modern sense, we'd say own a living, in a more ancient sense, you know, put the food on the table. You have to be able to do that to gain the kind of self-esteem that I think allows you to live a whole complete successful life as a human being. So I think that is the foundation, if you will, for the idea of self-interest. We can call it egoism. We can call it selfishness. I really don't want to get caught up on the word. I want to get caught up in this idea that the purpose of morality should be to provide us with universal principles to live the best damn life we can live, right? You only live, hopefully we agree on this, you only live once, I don't know if you're Buddhist or not, and there's no afterlife, I don't know if you're Christian or not. So I don't believe in an afterlife, I don't believe you live more than once. Make the most of the one life that you have and morality should be a tool, a guide for how to do that. And then we can argue about what are the particular virtues and values that are necessary, that are necessary in order to achieve a good life. But that to me is secondary to the first idea that the purpose of living is to live well. All right. I, I mean, I think that's enough for you to comment and I'm sure we'll have for a lot sure. of Okay. Yeah. I, I just didn't want to cut you off. You're still going. Yeah. yeah look, uh, so, so I, I think the, the part of that that seems right to me uh, is of course, well, okay. First of all, uh, I, I agree with you about the, uh, the reincarnation and, and afterlife issues. Uh, I think that we do just have uh, one life to live. We all do, right? Which is why I think that it's important that everybody uh, get a chance to to live up to uh, to their their full potential. Uh, and when we we talk about selfishness, right? If if what we mean by that is having regard for yourself, thinking maybe you even have duty a certain duty to yourself, uh, that you're you're trying to advance your own potential, then no, selfishness isn't bad. Uh, and if what we mean by selfishness is that you're promoting your own interests at the expense of the interests of others, then I think 
that it is bad. Uh, and, and I think that we're, um, that, that so far, right, you know, like we might be on the same page. I think that, I think that one place where the divergence happens uh, is that, um, is that reading Rand, I'm sure you've read lots more Ayn Rand than I have, right, you know, but, but, but reading what I've read, right, you often uh, get the impression from her first uh, that she thinks that like maybe all of philosophy in between Aristotle and her uh, is, uh, is denied uh, that, uh, that, you, uh, that you should try to uh, pursue your own talents, that individual potential is good, is say that all you should do all the time is just sacrifice yourself to other people, which uh, clearly isn't right, right? If, uh, if you're a utilitarian, your own happiness counts as much as anybody else. Uh, if you read Immanuel Kant uh, in the sort of thin Kant book that people read in introductory ethics classes, he gives four examples of immoral behavior and two of them, two of the four, uh, are examples about people failing to duties to themselves. Uh, there's the person who commits suicide and the, uh, the person who fails to develop uh, his talents. And certainly if you read somebody like John Rawls, he uh, puts great emphasis in how everybody should be able to have, there should be room for people to develop their own life plans, live according to their own conception of a good life within the bounds of certain duties to others. So I think where the real distinction happens, and I guess we'll just do this quickly, first in terms of abstract theory, and then maybe in terms of uh, political takeaway. In terms of abstract theory, I think the real distinction is whether, that, whether the difference between just pursuing your own flourishing and pursuing your own flourishing at the expense of other people is a meaningful distinction in the first place, right? So. I think uh, what Rand seems to think, uh, what, what from what I'm getting from you now and, uh, and what I got out of your debate with Gene Epstein, I think you think is that uh, that's not really a distinction at all. That like really, if you are harming the interests of other people, if you're getting in the way of flourishing the other people, you're really not uh, fulfilling your own potential or you're really not advancing your own interests. That the interests of rational people, I think Rand says, uh, can't conflict. Uh, and if that's your view, then, then I certainly, uh, that I certainly disagree. I think that, uh, I think that, like to go to Aristotle, uh, I think that Aristotle was able to flourish to a great extent to, uh, to spend his time thinking about science and philosophy and developing his intellectual potential and was probably a very happy person, despite the fact that he was freed up to do that by the labor of slaves. And I have no particular reason to think, given the values of the society that he lived in, that he ever lost a single night's sleep in his entire life over his participation in the institution of slavery. So I think it is possible uh, for people's interests to conflict. And at that point, you don't have to completely sacrifice yourself. You don't have to negate yourself to the point of this sort of pure altruism that maybe describes some threads of some extreme religious views, certainly doesn't describe much of anything else in the history of philosophy. Uh, but you do have to sometimes balance your own interests against the interests of other people. And real quickly on the political takeaways, I think that where this matters politically uh, is, okay, if we think it's important, it's valuable that everybody gets to live up to their full potential, then I don't want some people to fail to live up to their, uh, their full potential uh, because for example, they were born into poverty, so they have fewer opportunities than other people do. So they have to work some mind-numbing job where they never get the chance uh, to develop their intellectual or artistic or whatever other kinds of potential they might have had in a different kind of society. I don't want some people to spend all day giving orders and some people to spend all day to, uh, all day taking orders. I would prefer that people have democratic rights within uh, within a workplace like a worker cooperative and more on a more mundane level in terms of things that might happen in a much short more short-term way i don't want anybody for example not writing that novel they've always wanted to write not starting up you know that project they always wanted to start up uh because they couldn't because they uh because they have to work all the time uh, to, to support their family. They're worried that if they lose their job, they're gonna lose their private employer health insurance. That seems like a huge problem for human potential. So I think the two differences between us, as I read them, you can correct me, are one, whether you can have conflicts 
between people's flourishing, at which point you have to balance your own interests against the interests of other people, and two, whether capitalism actually serves everybody's flourishing uh, or whether changing that system uh, in both immediate reformist ways, uh, like giving everybody health care, giving everybody free higher education. So if you need to go back to school so you can start to live up to that potential that you currently can't live up to, you could do that, uh, would actually allow far more people to live up to their full human potential. So the challenge here is, you know, you're taking on here, you're moving us from morality to, to politics. And, you know, there's just no time to cover everything that you just covered. But let me, let me try to cover a few things. I mean, first of all, uh, you are, you're, you're saying that you agree with me on, on individual success or individuals living their own life. But you switch, you, you switch your um, frame of reference constantly. My frame of essence is the individual, the individual's pursuit of happiness, right? Now, we can talk about other individuals. We can talk about society. We can talk about the world, but that is a different frame of reference. My frame of reference is my life, achieving the best for my life, and everybody out there achieving the best for their lives, right? So you start with what, will, what are the premises that are necessary for me to achieve my success and my life, and then you generalize. You don't start with a duty to maximize social well-being as a utilitarian, as maximize the most happiness to most people or however you want to phrase it. You don't start with a duty to others. And then you say, within that duty, it's okay for you to achieve whatever you can achieve once you've achieved the duty to others. I'm rejecting that whole approach to morality, that whole approach to ethics. I'm saying whatever turns out to be my relationship to you and my commitment to you and my obligation to you, I hate the word duty, so I'm not going to use it, my commitment to you, has to come from my commitment to myself. That is the starting point is, what is the life that I live? I've got this one shot at it. Where does this responsibility that I have to other people come from? It doesn't come from God because neither of us, I think, believe in God. It doesn't come from something ingrained in us because clearly some of us don't have that ingrained uh, categorical imperative. I don't anyway. Um, it, 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 to, as a duty to start with a duty to others and only then. And, and of course, you do this with, with all the philosophers. There indeed is no philosopher, including Kant, particularly Kant, who advocates for the framework to be what's good for me. He says, yes, you should try to achieve whatever you can within a context of duties to others. But well, he the, believes in both. But he the, thinks, yeah, but you the have, primary, the thing that you have right, obligations to yourself yeah, but, and obligations to the others. If you're not developing yes, your talents, but, you're not the about that, following the, the categorical narrative. That, the thing that frames it, the categorical imperatives that frame it, are duties for others. I mean, Christianity no, does the same thing. I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm Look, sorry. Right. Let, let's just, let's just, let us just let me just finish. Okay, okay, okay. I'll let you finish your point. I mean, that's Christ, Christianity does the same thing, right? It says, oh, no, you should live the best life that you can live after you use Jesus Christ as a model for your life, right? So you set up altruism. You set up self-sacrifice. You set up the negation of self as the standard. And of course, Augustine Comte is the only one who's honest enough to actually say it when he says, if you even think about how you're going to benefit from helping somebody else, the joy, the, benefit, the emotional satisfaction from it, then it doesn't count as morality. He is the one that's actually honest about it, but philosophers generally, but look, I don't want to get into debate because I, I'm not going to win that debate because, you know, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a student of philosophy about what other philosophers said. I'm here to... Well, Say what well, I meant to reason, represent a positive view, not a negative view. Yeah, I think so, you're wrong so, about Kant, but I'm so, not going to so, quote so, you. So, anything, the, right? so the reason that the Kant thing is important, and I agree, I don't want to get too hung up on that, yeah. uh, but the reason this is more than just like an esoteric footnote about the history of philosophy, that Kant's view is that you have both kinds of obligations. This is not, yes, this, but, is not, this is not switching frameworks from caring about yourself and caring about where others. Where does the second Kant, obligation Kant, come from? Kant's I've, I've explained where your obligation to yourself okay. comes from. Well, where does the second obligation come from? Kant's where does it come from? Is that both kinds of obligations come from the same place, which is the categorical imperative, and that entails both duties to yourself to develop your own talents and duties to help other people. And again, the reason that's not just an esoteric footnote about what Kant thinks is that this is the view that actually people who disagree with Rand have, not Rand yes. straw man, of perfect I, altruism. I agree with you. I agree with you. Who, the who point think, is this. Who, who, think, who think that 
you should always sacrifice yourself and only act for the sake of others. But the actual view that people who disagree with Rand have is that, sure, you should care about developing your own talents, you should care about yourself, that's important. It's also important that you care about other people and helping them develop to their full potential. Uh, and the that is for both complete, is that's complete and, that that's if we think that human flourishing, human potential is valuable, it's valuable in myself, and I'm going to promote that and try to live up to my potential. It's also valuable in others, which is why I want to create a society where everybody has the best shot of living up to their potential. I don't, we haven't, I haven't got to society yet. I am all for a society where everybody has a shot to maximize their potential. Absolutely. We disagree on what that society looks like. I've lived in a society like yours. I've experienced it. I know what are, kind are, of- are you, are, you, are you calling Israel the society like mine? I'm calling it Israel in pre-1977, pre uh, and I'm calling the kibbutz very much the society that you would have loved, that, that you advocate for, and, and I would consider it a, a horrible life. It's, it's one, one of the reasons I left, one of the many reasons I left, and, and one of the reasons when I experienced the kibbutz, I knew- firsthand, you know, the extent to which socialism didn't do what you claim it does. It does the exact opposite. But I don't want to get there yet, right? I'm, I'm happy to go on and debate socialism at some point. I'm much more interested in this debate. The point is that, yes, everybody says we want both. We want you to sacrifice other people, and we want you to live a good, flourishing life. But in any decision where the two are in competition, we know what is elevated above the other. We know what we, we know so. what we as a society, we know what we as a culture view as important. What we as a culture and view as a society view as important is how we act, is the sacrifice we do to other people, the saints that we have. And saints, I include secular saints. The people we elevate as moral heroes are always, always the people who have a horrible life but have lived for the sake of other people. Happy people, happy people, flourishing people, successful people, people who've lived well that have experienced life to the fullest, have experienced life to the most, never make it to moral sainthood, not in your socialist mythology, okay, well, for, and not well, in Christian for... mythology, and not in popular culture mythology. Now, let me get, let me get so, back a so, second. So, 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 let so me get I'm back not, to the conflict of I'm interest. I'm not interested in sainthood, right? But if you want to but ask but people, sainthood is the people, standard people for what we consider who, the moral ideal. It's, think, it's a standard for what we consider the moral ideal and therefore what we're striving towards. Is certainly somebody who I admire. Who, uh, who, who do you admire? Uh, would, would, be, uh, would be Paul Robeson, who's, uh, who's uh, an example of somebody. But who, Paul Robeson, you admire yes, him because he suffered. Tremendous. You admired him because he struggled, not because he was happy and successful. Part of the reason, I admire Paul Robeson because he had a great voice. Robeson is admired uh, is precisely his development of his individual talents as a musician and in other ways. No. But if also... Yes, of course. Absolutely. But if he was we just that, that, if he but was just also, that, you wouldn't admire also, him. Also, we admire the fact that he's not just doing that, that he's also trying to create a society where other people can live up to their potential because they matter just as much. It's not true that every time there's a conflict between yourself and others, yes, uh, 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 Paul Robson. say that you always have to sacrifice yourself. I don't know any leftist or socialist who thinks that we should have uh, involuntary distribution of kidneys, uh, that, uh, that you're a bad person if you don't do organ donation. No, you know, nobody on the left says that. What they do say reflects oh, a reasonable balance between your own interests and the interests of everybody else. That, in other words, everybody, everybody could live a good life, but you also have to pay some taxes that support things like health care and education so everybody else can have their basic needs met and have a meaningful opportunity to pursue their dreams. Yes, if you work in a worker cooperative or one of those kibbutzim that you hate so much, uh, you have a vote, vote and a voice, but so does everybody else. And that's why it's, they it's don't not, exist it's, it's not a binary choice between letting yourself live a good life and a full life and, and live up to your potential and letting other people. The question rather is how can you live a good life and also help everybody else too? So I am relieved that you are not after my kidney. But I also know that you would love to come into my house and take my stuff, my stuff. Uh, I also know that no, you would love no. to get into my I'd, bank account. I'd love account. to take a little bit of your bank account. Uh, no, no, no. You would, the there's no limit. The only reason I have no stuff, limit. 
There's, no, let me, let's be clear. The only reason I have stuff is because I have a bank account and I have money in the bank account. And the more you take, and look, they already take 50% of my bank, my, my, what I have in my bank account. You would like to take 90%. You would ultimately, if you're a real socialist and you believe in a kibbutz, you would like to take 100%. You would like to tell me exactly what I would have in my house. I lived on a kibbutz. I know a kibbutz. You don't have a television bigger than mine. Everybody has the same television. Everybody has the same kitchen. Actually, nobody has a kitchen because we all eat in a communal dining space. So let's be honest about what socialism is. You want to come into my house. You want to take my stuff. You want to take everything in my bank account, or at least the significant majority of what I have in my uh, bank account. Nobody wants, wanna, to, nobody let, wants let, to take anything I, from I, left, I let you. I let you finish. Um, and, and of course you do. I mean, that's exactly what socialism is. You want, if I, let me ask you this, in a socialist society, like in my society, in a free market society, uh, you can start a commune, you can start a kibbutz, you can do your thing, you can uh, share each according to his, from each according to his ability, each according to his needs. You can do all that and live pathetic, miserable lives. But, you know, if I wanted to start a business in your society, I would go to jail. If somebody wanted to be my employee and create a product and sell it based on the standards of employee, employer relationship, I would go to jail. So don't tell me for one second that you are for freedom and for people exercising their own potential, or you don't want to come into my house and take my stuff. Of course you do. You should admit it because that is exactly what is involved. The kibbutz, when you joined the kibbutz, you didn't keep your stuff. You put all your stuff into communal bank account and they took all of your stuff. You don't want a voluntary kibbutz. You want the entire country to be a kibbutz. That's what socialism is. And you want all of us to put our money into a joint account. Now, but, but let me, let me, I want to address whoa, 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 the philosophical whoa, whoa, point whoa, that you made. You just, you just said a lot there, Yared. So I so, did, but that's so, because you're, you're, you're drifting to politics when I still I'm, have I'm my ethical the point. same question. The question of, whether we only have an obligation to ourselves. I think we have an obligation to other people. I think you have, against an obligation, I think, obligation to other people is the same question as the question no, of, of whether of I should have my political way, rights. I, let me ask you one question rights. and then I'll shut up. Sure. Me, can I ask you one question then I'll, I'll be quiet. Sure. And let you ask what you like. I mean, I, I claim that the obligation to yourself comes from the fact that you have one life, that you are you, and that you have this fundamental choice in life between living and dying, and that living requires certain actions, and requires you to your mind, requires a certain focus, requires certain thinking. It requires something. That's where the obligation to you comes from. I believe that the obligation to other people comes from that obligation. So you have an obligation to other people, but the primary obligation is to you because you are the living entity, and, and you have this one life, and, and it's your choices that have to be made. I'd like to ask you, you seem to think that these two obligations are the same, I think you actually think your obligation to other people is higher than the obligation to yourself. I want, just want to know where they come from, philosophically. And don't say the categoric imperatives because that is the biggest cop-out in the world. That's like saying God, right? I want to know in logic, where does it come from? Because for Kant, categorical imperatives are God. We know that, right? He was very religious, very Christian. And at the end of the day, that's what he meant. Where do these categorical imperatives, where does this duty to others come from that places it above your, your responsibilities and obligations to yourself or at the same level as it. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, Kant's, Kant's view uh, is, is not actually uh, a religious view at all. There is an argument that he makes you know, for the existence of God at the end, because I think in Prussia at the time he was doing it, you kind of had to do that. But the moral system itself no, too is, uh, is, completely, uh, is completely secular uh, and, uh, and completely detachable from that. But look, the reason that we have moral obligations to others is the same reason we have moral obligations to ourselves. That because the fact that I only have one life to live and my life, my flourishing has value, similarly, everybody else only has one life to live and their life, their flourishing has value. So I shouldn't be trampling on it for the sake of mine. Now, this is not, this is not a binary choice between living only for yourself and dying. You can live, but also while pursuing your own dreams, help create a society and participate in a society where everybody else can pursue their dreams. So for example, nobody, Yard, 
nobody, I, I really hope you get this because this, you'll be able to sleep much easier knowing this. No one wants to come into your house and take your personal possessions. In fact, but if, but of course she do this. No, we don't. In fact, do. if you read even Karl Marx, even the Communist Manifesto, there is a distinction there between personal property and private property in the means of production. Like, you know, it's it's very quick, right? You can read it in after. My, my, I'm a finance guy. My is, means of production are right here. The, my means of production is my computer. Is you can't differentiate between the means of production and private property and and personal property. Right, that is bizarre. Right, and the idea. Right, gotta, gotta finish. Gotta finish the point here. That they have uh, that private property in the external means of production. Nobody says means of production and means. The, you know, your muscle, your brain, they're talking about the external, the social means of production. And there is a distinction there between that and personal property. No one but, wants to take your personal property. So you don't yeah. want to take what the we, 200 we, billion we, away Yara, from- Yara, got, got, to fit, got, to finish, got, to fit, got to finish here. Talk for a while, Yara. The point is that now we do want to take some of what is in your bank account in order, so for example, if someone else's dream, someone else's flourishing is to uh, go to medical school and become a doctor. Someone else's dream uh, is, that, uh, is that they're going to become a great artist, etc. that they're not blocked from it because they can't afford to pursue an education. They're not blocked from it because they can't quit the job they hate because they'll lose their employer health insurance. They're not blocked from it because they have to work constantly at a mind-numbing job just to survive. So it's not that either we can, uh, we can care about ourselves, we can flourish, we can live good lives, we can develop our talents, or we can care about other people. In fact, a reasonable, a reasonable approach to life involves absolutely nurturing your own talents, but also doing what's necessary to contribute to society where everybody else can nurture their talents too. So, so I'm, I'm, I have no problem with the fact that part of life is helping people out there achieve their own success. Indeed, you know, what do I do with my life? I, I, I do this kind of stuff, not because, just because I enjoy it, but because I'm hoping that some of your listeners might discover a philosophy that'll make their life better. So I care about other people as because it's part of my life. And, and you're right, my own flourishing, my own success, part of that is other people's flourishing and success. But this is the point. You want to handcuff me. You want to decide, you want to decide, or the majority want to decide what dreams I should have, what dreams are worthy and what dreams are unworthy. I, I'll give you a quick example. Jeff Bezos has a dream of building a spaceship to go to Mars. Now, you might think that's funny, or you might think that's ridiculous, or you might think that, oh, how dare he, which is, I expect what you think. He needs $100 billion to do that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna allow him to do that. Clearly, you say the most important dreams are the dreams of those people who don't have health insurance or whatever, whatever you come up with as your you decide what dreams are worthy and what dreams are not worthy. And you're going to sacrifice the dreams of some people by definition, because you believe in a zero sum world. I do not. See, I believe that the way for individuals to prosper is by leaving them alone, by helping them when it's in my interest to help them, by assisting them when I want to assist them. You believe in organized coercion, organized force, organized command and control that determines the hierarchy of dream, people's dreams, takes dreams from some and gives them to others. Um, and, and, and thus, I believe, destroy everybody's dreams. Because the other thing you assume in the video you showed early on assumes, you assume that wealth is a given, that money is just there. That, oh, no, uh, I don't. I think it's yes, created, you do. I think it's created production, by labor. I the think, production I think just the, happens. The, labor the doesn't produce. Lays the golden egg. Labor, is labor the produce, class that, that labor Jeff produces. Would have a red cent, even if not for the people who work in his warehouses. And of course, that needs to be brought and utter with, economic with, with, with e physical with physical capital. Complete that and that utter could be done in a, it, in a worker cooperative. That could be done in a publicly owned firm. That could be done in a number of different situations. 
But no, it can't. Is, no, it can't. None of that could be done in a worker cooperative. None of it has yeah, been done in a worker cooperative. Spain. They have cannot a be done in a worker cooperative. They have a fantastic research and development arm. Who does? Uh, Madrigan in Spain. Oh, come Madrigan on. Every debate I hear about Madrigan. You should actually do your research they about Madrigan. Wonderful research and development arm. There's lots of There's lots of yes, innovation. No, I, I, there's I, there's I, lots I, of innovation going on there. But yeah. here's the point. I use hey, Zoom, I, developed by Madrigan. I use many apps on my iPhone, developed by Madrigan. Madrigan is so innovative and productive that its apps uh, uh, and its applications and technologies are known worldwide. The one co-op that still exists, and one wonders why it exists, partially because it has spun off a number of its businesses that actually run like normal businesses and, and the ones that would produce money. Uh, and, and it treats its employees, at least in portions of its business, like every business owner treats its employees. It's a very, very mixed case that you bring up. But it's the one example you have. Every innovation that you're using right now, every innovation that all of your, all of your listener uses every single day in every single aspect was a product of some individual's mind. Some entrepreneur had to think of the idea. Some scientist oh, that's, that's had not, to that's invent the process. Well. And yes, that's and not yes, at all how innovation works. Of in the course real it world. is. Of it's course it is. Product and, of one and, entrepreneur's of, mind. Well, of course it is. It, you always need. Times, you often need an entrepreneur. In an it doesn't R&D happen in an R and D department. This but, is my but, point. But, but I, I don't this is my point about you thinking wealth is just there. Wealth is an achievement. Wealth requires. The, the, yes. the focused effort of certain individuals. It, not everybody can achieve that, whereas manual labor is not an achievement. Manual labor is something human beings have been able to do from the beginning of time. Manual labor is interchangeable. It doesn't matter if Joe or Janet does the manual labor, but it certainly matters whether Joe or Janet was the head of Apple uh, it, it, at the beginning, but Joe and Janet couldn't have done what Steve did didn't do what Steve did, and nobody has done what Steve did other than Steve, right? So well, the difference is, the of, fundamental of differences, and this is what, did quite a this bit is what wealth Steve, leads to. But, but, but this but is what here's, wealth comes from. It the comes from the mind of cause, Steve. Because I, I do not want to let this get lost, right, yeah. in the couple of minutes we have left, that you talked about organized force. You talked about some yeah. people's dreams being yeah. sacrificed to other people's dreams. Now, any society, uh, where you enforce any rules, very much including a no trespass inside, is going to involve some element of coercion. The question is which rules that you're coercively enforcing are justified? Uh, and do I, uh, do I want Jeff Bezos to be able to have $100 million generated by, uh, by the labor, physical and mental of people who work for him? in his warehouses, people who work for him in his R&D department. Do I want him to have those to spend on a spaceship to go to Mars? Well, I think spaceships to go to Mars are nice, but somehow I'm a little bit more concerned about giving a basic, decent minimum to the people who work in those warehouses and make him rich so they can achieve their full potential in life. Um, Now, obviously there have been a lot of strands of what we talked about today. It's a huge, Can I just say something about property? It's a, it's a huge discussion. I'm gonna give you the last word uh, okay. before we go. Uh, okay. But, uh, but, but I, I do wanna make sure, uh, because obviously in the last 40 minutes or whatever it's been, we've just scratched the surface. I think that's yeah, inevitable. Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so so I, I do want you to come back uh, to, uh, to pursue some of these other strands, to, uh, to talk about some of the political takeaways of all this. But, uh, but, for, but uh, before we go to David Griscom for the last segment, uh, I'm going to give you the last word. Sure. Thank you. So uh, let me just say something about property. This idea that property rights do not trespass is some optional thing and that defending property rights is, you know, is just as coercive as taking money from our bank account, which is truly coercive. You're stealing it. Um, it that is ludicrous. Human life requires human life, individual human life requires that, and this goes back to the, to the foundations of what I talked about. If I produce something, I produced it. Whether I grow vegetables in my garden, that is mine. I produce it, and then I can, ex- then I can exchange it. If, if there is no no trespassing sign, if that no trespassing sign in my garden doesn't exist, then what you have is anarchy. What you have is the only means by which human beings can negotiate with one another, can, can live with one another, is through force. 
This is, a, this is feudalism. This is every pre-capitalist system of government. This is the kind of government where the force, the gun, was what pervaded in human interaction. Capitalism is an achievement because it takes away the idea of using coercion in order to gain values. I create my garden. You don't trespass on it. That should be pretty simple to understand. And then if I negotiate on a, in, a, in a voluntary manner with other people to have them come and help cultivate the garden, and I pay them a salary for that, it's voluntary. Nobody's being forced to do it. Uh, that is the essence of what freedom means. Now, you're saying, no, they should be able to take my fruit. They should be able to uh, do whatever they want with my land, with my, what, what, is, what I have cultivated. That is a recipe for human disaster. That is a recipe for violence and destruction. And it's a recipe for the destruction of civilization. Property rights are a massive achievement. And of what well, have led to the, I'll finish on this, that what have led to the creation of wealth that you now want to expropriate today, that over the last 250 years that have led to the, in the West at least, the annihilation of real poverty in the West, and to a standard of living that was unimaginable. That is a product of property rights, which is just one aspect of individual rights more broadly. But right. There's a lot to talk about, as you said. Yeah, there, there, there is. Uh, I agree with you that capitalism is better than feudalism. Uh, maybe you can come well, back. Paul Marx said that, so that's uh, no big, big deal. <laughs> maybe you can come back to talk with me more about whether we could do better than capitalism and also whether the... Uh, Individual we could have it for one. We've never had it, so it was yeah, great. The individual, the individual gardener uh, who's, uh, who's negotiating with other people at the same level as him is a good model for how capitalism actually works, but that is going to have to be a future discussion. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for coming on, Yaren. Uh, we are thank definitely going to have to do this again. I appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having right. me on. Bye. Thank you.